hi folks um thanks for having us what a treat um i'm dan howarth this is pete bates hello and uh, we work at the, the, the department for work and pensions so we're going to share um a cautionary tale about delivering at pace during the covid19 pandemic um where we've been working the wrong way for the right reasons hopefully We'll let you judge. <laughs> we will indeed. <laughs> um, so we're user-centered content designers. Um, I know there'll be some user-centered content designers in the audience, but some that won't be and probably don't necessarily know what it is. So we'll just do a brief explainer. We design content for services at DWP. Um, people use services to help them do something like learn to drive, buy a house, or in the work that me and Pete do, get financial support for a situation that they're in. We work on multidisciplinary teams to do this. So we work alongside people like user researchers, interaction designers, business analysts, product managers, engineers and testers, and many others. And we're often the only content designer on the team. So as you can imagine, Teams have a lot of different priorities and competing values. So this is what we do at a very high level. We design content to meet user needs and make complex language and processes easy to understand. And then we understand and implement style and standards. And one of those standards is the, the government service standard, which amongst other things, make sure we're identifying and meeting user needs in our service. And we get assessed um, against the service standard at different delivery phases from alpha to live. And we also follow a set of design principles to make sure that we're working in the right way. And there are 10 design principles in total, but I'm just gonna tell you about three of them. The first one is start with user needs. If you don't know what the user needs are, you will not build the right thing. Do research, analyze data, talk to users, don't make assumptions. And coronavirus has made this really difficult for us as it's removed most of the opportunities we have for talking to users. So we'll come back to assumptions a little bit later. Principle five is iterate, then iterate again. The best way to build good services is to start small and iterate wildly, release minimum viable products early and test them with actual users because iteration reduces risk. So again, coronavirus has wreaked havoc on this in two ways. First, in many cases, we've not been able to test with actual users. Second, we've had to respond to policy changes and constantly changing priorities, which has slashed the time that it takes to keep iterating specific parts of the service. And then principle six, this is for everyone. The people who most need our services are often the people who find them hardest to use. Let's think about those people from the start. So people with assisted digital and accessibility needs are amongst the hardest people to reach during the pandemic. Even if we're screen sharing through Teams, it's nigh impossible to test things with users who have visual impairments like sight loss, for example. Invariably, we've been forced into a utilitarian approach, prioritizing work that affects the highest volumes of users. You might have seen the government design principles kicking around in various formats. And they're also on posters like these ones that GDS produced a few years ago. GDS, that's a government digital service. And uh, so this is a tale of two services stood up for COVID-19. They're both services for applying for a benefit. Pete works on apply for pension credit. And I've worked on apply for new style employment and support allowance. So I will pass you over to Pete. Hi there. Yeah. So as Dan says, um, I work on pension credit. Um, if you could skip to the next slide, please, Dan. Um, pension credit is a benefit for those on a low income in retirement. 
It's means tested, which means we want to know a lot of detail about your financial situation, your income, your savings. Um, until COVID hit us, we were working on an advisor facing service. Um, claimants had to apply by phone. Uh, they would have to post us evidence of various things that they were telling us about. Um, and our users often needed help from a third party, a friend or a family member or a charity. Uh, and that person had to be sitting with them to go through security. And this support, it wasn't readily available during lockdown. Uh, neither was the opportunity to pop out to the post office for a lot of people. Uh, from a business point of view, we had advisors working from home, self-isolating, etc., without the kit to do their job on the phones. Uh, and all of this is at a time when the volume of applications was rising quickly. Uh, our applications are some of the most vulnerable people in society, uh, and they were feeling the effects of the pandemic as much as anyone, losing work, losing loved ones that they relied on for their finances, and generally needing our help. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So a citizen-facing service was something that was already on our roadmap for transforming pension credit. Uh, then we got the call from our stakeholders that brought it forwards by about a year. Um, a discovery for that online service would have been between four and eight weeks on its own. And that would have been our opportunity to decide whether this was the right thing to do, uh, to find out exactly who our users are, what they need, and really dig into the policy behind it. Um, we missed that. We also missed out the alpha phase, uh, where we should have been trying a bunch of different solutions, testing the assumptions we were making about solving our users' problems, and figuring out how this all fits into the wider pension credit journey. Um, instead, we stood up a whole service which currently has around about 75 pages altogether in a little under four weeks. So uh, there we were on gov.uk, ready to test our assumptions and figure out whether it was the right thing to do in a pretty public way. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So one of the main challenges we had was the fact that we were taking away the advisors that act as an intermediary between the applicant and the application. Some of the information we asked for was quite detailed. Some of the decisions are quite complex. Uh, and the advisor would usually broker these difficult conversations and help the applicants give us the right information. These advisors have a wealth of knowledge, uh, what's important to know, what's not so important, where applicants can find information that we're going to ask them for, all sorts of stuff. Um, these are the same advisors that now process the applications once they're submitted online. Uh, so it's really important to get the questions right, get the information right first time. Otherwise, the advisors would have to pick up the phone anyway meaning more delays to people getting the help they need, as well as defeating the object of standing up this service in the first place. But next slide, Dan. So one of the most important aspects of making this a success was that we knew a lot of the core user needs of our applicants already from the agent-facing service. Uh, we know they're trying to get access to the money they need to live. Uh, as I say, pension credit is a low-income benefit, and uh, it's the difference for a lot of people between living in poverty or not. So although this, this is an application for that same benefit, we hadn't done any research end-to-end uh, -end with users who were gonna be applying online. So we drew on what we knew from our advisor facing service. Uh, our user researcher had been with the team almost from the start. So we already had a good head start on what kind of problems our applicants face. Um, and even within the constraints of a pandemic, our researcher managed to do some really impressive research and even testing in terms of both quantity and quality. Uh, we were able to research with the advisors who'd been taking the applications over the phone with existing contacts from charities and third parties who help applications and even some guerrilla testing of various screens, interactions and content uh, with our friends and family and uh, anyone else we get our hands on, really. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So I'm just going to go through a couple of bits of content that we've ended up with in the service. Uh, one of the biggest conversations we have with applicants is about the money they have. As it's a means-tested benefit, we treat your savings and assets as things that could generate income for you. So without an advisor to guide you through this conversation and explain that, it can be a bit overwhelming adding up all your life savings or more often lack of. Uh, applicants also have to tell us these figures on two different dates today and because they can backdate their application, a date up to three months in the past. So in the advisor-facing version of the service, um, we would do this in quite a long-winded way. Uh, ask people account by account, month by month, um, whether they had something, how much it was. Um, but throughout all of this, what we've learned is that people have two, maybe three accounts. So it felt like overkill to take that approach on the online application. So what we went live with is this, a bulleted list of everything we need to know about and asking for a total overall figure on each date. 
Um, so for most people who have simple finances, current and savings account, it works reasonably well. Uh, it is, however, one of our most iterated pages. You know, we know there's a lot we can do to make it simpler. Uh, for example, if someone has less than £10,000, it doesn't affect the amount of pension credit they get. So we don't really need to take those exact figures. We're playing with some ideas around that. Um, but if someone has more complex finances, um, we know there's a lot we can do to make it simpler from that for them. You know, it's a hell of a calculation to do in your head if you have shares, premium bonds, money in a different currency, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please, Dan. So uh, another thing that we've got in the service is if you've moved into a care home and you still own the house you left behind, pension credit treats that home you've left behind as a second property in the same way as any other investment. So we have to be careful here with the language we use um, to determine what we're actually asking. Uh, we've had to avoid the word home uh, because even if someone has moved somewhere else, uh, they often consider the place they've left behind still to be their home. So people can answer wrongly if we're not super clear. And uh, it's actually really important to get this money right, not just from a protecting the public purse angle, but our users tell us that they're really terrified of being overpaid. The last thing they want is to be paying back an overpayment when they're already on a budget. Next slide, please, Dan. Uh, yeah, this one, adding children into an application is pretty complex. And because of that, it wasn't possible to build it into the service for day one. Uh, we have to root people out of the service and ask them to make an application by phone instead. Uh, and this page here, it's something that's still in the service to this day. Uh, it's something I hate, something I've agonized over, something I've rewritten about 15 times, trying to make it simple qualifying young people you know they qualify by meeting dwp's rules rules that we haven't really explained in any useful detail anywhere and, uh, and this page is really my secret shame i just wanted to share it in a confessional kind of way you know to this day i don't think any user has ever mentioned it either in live feedback surveys or in user testing and i really wish they would you know i'd love this page to move up the backlog and do something about it but next slide please dan so one of the reasons we were able to move so quickly was involving people at the right time. You know, all of our stakeholders have their own ways of working, their own networks of people to involve and their own sign off processes. So the sign off processes often come at the end and they always take time and their time scale are invariably longer than an agile teams. So we're actually lucky enough on pension credit to have a policy advisor embedded on the team. He helps us understand the intent of the policy, uh, what we need our users to do and what we need to tell them. Uh, we also have operational subject matter experts on the team, and they help us understand not only what the requirements are, but also who our users are. You know, they've got a lot of experience in dealing with them. Uh, they know what they struggle with, what information they have to chase up, all sorts of nuggets of information that we'd never uncover ourselves in a million years. Uh, another thing we do is run regular sprint, sprint reviews to take people along the journey with us as we work. Uh, pretty much every stakeholder we have was involved right from the start. Uh, you know, these are the people that tell you you're on the right track and they persuade other stakeholders. Uh, but more importantly, they know the landscape that you're fitting into. They know your users and your problems. So involve them in design, you know, at an early stage. If you work together to understand as much of the context as you can, you're far more likely to design something that fits. And there won't be any surprises at the wrong times. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. Um, so yeah, another couple of processes that we use to try and maintain the quality as we navigated the apocalypse, um, content crits. Uh, running a content crit is a great way to get the expertise of other content designers. With a 75 page service and limited time for user testing, it's really helpful to get all the feedback and support you can in putting the content in the right place at the right time. Um, so in a crit, if you give people enough context to understand what you're asking them to look at, but not so much context that you're solutionizing or putting your own assumptions in their head. Ask for feedback based on their experience and expertise, not their opinions. So uh, if you find it hard to carve out the time to run a content crit, then try harder. It's a really important tool. It really helped me throughout this process. Uh, and if you Google content crits, you'll find a really useful article written by our colleague, Jane. Um, that's a really good read, really good introduction. Um, it's also really useful to ask for informal feedback if you don't have time to run a full crit. Uh, ask a colleague or two to have a look over things that you're working on. And, uh, some of my biggest light bulb moments came from impromptu rants on Slack or Slack calls. Uh, yeah, next slide, please, Dan. So another thing that we found really useful during this was a series of peer reviews. 
uh, as well as content designers, like we say, uh, like Dan was saying before, you know, we have interaction designers, user researchers, engineers, and all sorts of other colleagues on the team. Uh, so we managed to get peer reviews from our respective heads of role. Um, so part of the review of that was obviously to assure them of the approach we were taking and the quality of the work. But these people have been about a bit, you know, they've overseen a lot of services and in the case of my head of role, content. Um, so it can be a bit scary showing unfinished, scrappy work to experienced colleagues, particularly senior ones, but it is really worth it. You know, if you can shake off that feeling of your work being judged, there's a wealth of expertise on offer for you. You know, no matter how wacky your situation, how niche the question you have to ask is, you're probably not the first to come across it or something similar enough that it's helpful to share. So grab those opportunities. You know, we work in teams, but we're also part of wider communities. Don't forget that. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. Uh, we went through a service assessment shortly before we let the service out into the wild. Uh, for anyone that isn't from government, a service assessment is a group of colleagues spending about four hours in a virtual room with you, going through your service from end to end, making sure it meets the service standard for gov.uk. Again, pretty scary, but it's not there to trip you up. You know, there's no trap door. You're not going to fall through the floor if you don't meet the standard. Just a lot of guidance to help you do the right thing that needs doing. So assessors are experienced user-centered design folk themselves. You know, they've all been on the other side of the table in this situation. They know what helps and what doesn't. You know, the best thing you can do is not take anything personally. It's more free advice. And it is a bit of judgment. You know, our service didn't meet the standard at the first pass, but it was all fair enough. Uh, we took everything on the chin and took it away and iterated where we needed to. Uh, yeah, next slide, please, Dan. So because we missed the discovery and alpha phases, we ended up with a live service, but still a lot to learn. You know, obviously we have pain points, but to date we've had almost 70,000 successful applications through the service and we've still got an alpha banner, which is a bit weird, but onwards and upwards. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So uh, one of the things that they'll decide in an assessment is whether you've solved a whole problem for users. And I can't honestly say that we have yet. You know, what we've done was solve a pretty immediate problem, time constrained, by building a shiny front end on a bunch of existing problems. You know, I said earlier, our roadmap has shifted a bit to accommodate all the work we've done. So this thing now exists. It's a milestone on our roadmap. Whether it's the right starting point for the long term, that remains to be seen. But one thing we can't do is ignore it. You know, there's more to come. We've learned a hell of a lot over the last 10 months. It wasn't expected, but it's put us in a really good position as a team to carry on with the transformation of the whole service and the whole pension credit benefit. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So, you know, what do you do from here? We've done a lot of work that we're proud of. We've done a lot of work that was good enough in the short term. Um, and Dan's going to let you know a bit about what he's got in place to keep moving forward now that the immediate panic's over. So I'll mute myself because I want to make a few notes and steal most of his techniques. Thanks, Pete. Or is that Tanuki Mario? <laughs> told, you, told you to get you back. That's better than looking at my hair at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, apply for New Style ESA has followed many of the same patterns that the Pete's described. New Style ESA is a, a benefit that people can get if they have a health condition or a disability that affects how much they can work. It's a contributory benefit. So it's not means tested. People have to have paid enough national insurance contributions to be eligible and meet a, a bunch of other eligibility criteria. Like Pete, we got the service on gov.uk in four weeks. We also had the added challenge of enabling people who were affected by coronavirus to claim the benefit, which was a new evolving policy. So. Before the plague in February last year, the service was in a small scale private beta in a few job centres. Up to that point, people came into a job centre if they wanted to apply for New Style ESA. Um, they'd speak to a work coach, fill in a paper form, or they'd do it over the phone. Come March, all the job centres were closed and the helpline was saturated. Hundreds of thousands of people were queuing to get support. That's because New Style ESA shares a phone line with universal credit, ouch. And the majority couldn't even get through. So apply for New Style ESA was designated as a COVID-19 response service. 
and people were redeployed to it from other services at DWP, including me. Our brief was to get the service into public beta in four weeks, which meant get it on gov.uk and make it available to as many people as possible. Four weeks later, we were up and running and taking 1,500 new claims a day by the skin of our teeth. Q, many more months of work to get the new service to meet the service standard. Um, meanwhile, we have to do everything that a public beta service needs to do, meet accessibility regulations, have a Welsh language version, pass a GDS beta assessment. We were building the plane while flying it. Which brings us to the first problem. We're a fully remote team based around the country and working from home. Most of us have never met before. Everything is a priority. How on earth do we maintain content quality? Fortunately, I was speaking to this beautiful man, Dean Smith, a content designer on budgeting loans at the time, now sadly at the Environment Agency. Um, we miss him. He had the ingenious idea of using Confluence as a single source of truth for content. What's ingenious about that, I hear you say, Confluence is a pain in the back end. Um, I heard it described recently as a burning trash fire, but that says everything about how it's used at the moment um, and not how it could be used. And to really see its beauty, if we can see such a thing in Confluence. Um, if you don't know what Confluence is, by the way, it's essentially a, a wiki that, that teams can create to document um, things, knowledge generally. Um, so yeah, to see its beauty, you've really got to understand our predicament. Um, we don't use content management systems on services. Content is generally hard coded into the code base of a service. Content designers are messing around with copy decks in Word documents, with manual version control, um, spreadsheets, PowerPoint decks, emails, Jira tickets, screenshots, screenshots of words. Um, you know, sometimes content's finalized in a prototype. There's no single source of truth. There's no generally, not generally any best practice. And it's usually a bit of a combination of all of those things. So people on the team use different devices, even different networks, but everybody can get on Confluence and Jira. So we created a content workflow in Jira and used Confluence as a single source of truth for content and design documentation. Now, I'm just going to switch to the browser and show you a quick demo. Um, right. So each page in the service has a corresponding Confluence page. Um, this is the question that we ask about coronavirus in the eligibility checker. We've got relevant JIRA tickets at the top. It has um, neat out of the box JIRA integration that shows you the title and the status of the ticket. Um, in fact, let's just have a quick look at one of those tickets. Um, I'll have a look at this one. Um, the JIRA ticket needs to meet a definition of ready to proceed into development. Uh, it needs a clear problem statement. Um, it needs a user story, if it's a story ticket. Design assets with a link to the corresponding confluence source of truth pages. And acceptance criteria um, for the testers to write tests against. Um, we write this as a team and find out more about the problem throughout the design process. And once we, we know enough, the engineers and testers can story point it in three amigos, at which point it's ready to prioritize for development. There's a bit of, bit of agile jargon in there. Um, back over to Confluence. So we've got um, the content record, which is this bit here, which is color coded to show pending changes. And it's not ideal, but it works. There's metadata like URL path, um, page title. Uh, then we've got the content in English and in Welsh. Thanks to Pete, I robbed this um, approach from, from him. Thanks, Pete. You're very welcome. And <laughs> Um, in, the con in, in the code base, the content is stored in JSON files 
So we break it down like this to match the, the JSON key value pairs. Like that's the, the name of the JSON key. That's the content that goes in the, the English version. That's the content that goes in the Welsh version. And it means that engineers can copy and paste it straight into the code base. And testers use this to write their tests against it. So there's a, there's a link to the prototype, um, which uses the gov.uk prototyping kit to mock up the page that's in the service. And um, it also shows how it fits into the flow of the service. Then there's evidence for the page's existence. So in this case, copies of shielding letters whose messaging we're trying to be consistent with. Um, so pe people are shielding from, because of coronavirus, virus that have received a, a letter from the Public Health Authority, whether that's NHS England, Scotland, or, or in Wales. Um, likewise, consistency with pages on gov.uk um, that are generally part of the user journey, such as our gov.uk start page for the service. Then um, evidence and common keywords from Google Trends, as well as um, keywords from website feedback, which really has been our primary and often only source of dialogue, even if it's passive with users. Um, and there's NHS open data um, on people who are shielding because of coronavirus, which again, lets us find out more about them demographically at quite a high level, such as like the ages of people who were shielding. And the further down here, we've got the problem statement or the latest problem statement that we're working with on that page. And then hypotheses that underpin the content and the design um, on that page as well. And then as well, previous iterations of the page as well. There's quite a lot of stuff in there. Obviously, Confluence has got inbuilt version control as well. So the previous iterations at the bottom are just the major ones, the major changes that we've that we've pulled out. So I'll just flip back over the slides. So what impact did this have? We could work side by side with engineers and testers without an awkward time consuming handoff process. The whole team were maintaining it, maintaining it and documenting evidence and iterations. And this was facilitating content design on the team. It wasn't just me doing it, which was brilliant. It meant that we could move much faster and juggle lots of work at the same time. It allowed work to be parked and picked up again later and then let us switch contexts really quickly when we're moving from teams meeting to teams meeting to teams meeting and, um, and then report back to stakeholders as well. It also helped with the, the team's mental well-being, reducing cognitive load and promoting shared understanding. And the documentation came in really useful when preparing for our service standard assessment. Now, I've called this a cheat, but really it isn't. It's just good practice for managing content workflow on fully remote, remote teams, especially when you're used to working with spit and sawdust. On to the next problem. Having such a tight deadline and um, get a service on gov.uk in four weeks meant that we inevitably had to go for the quick wins. There were some problems that were too big to tackle in such a tight time frame not least because they can take much longer to fully understand. But how do you prioritize when everything's a priority? Surely something's got to give. So I popped my head above the parapet to see how other disciplines handle this kind of thing. And engineers have a mature and well-established process for it. Has anyone heard of technical debt or tech debt? It's often the scourge of the user-centered content designer or the user-centered designer in general. You'll know it as, can you write an error message for this technical problem? And no, sorry, we can't build that seemingly simple feature until the code is refactored, whatever that means. But it's there for a reason. It allows technical teams to release quickly and get quick wins and push bigger problems down the line and back into the backlog. 
This is what Ward Cunningham, co-author of the Agile Manifesto, who coined the term technical debt, says about it. Technical debt includes those internal things that you choose not to do now, but will impede future development if left undone. So it's a metaphor that helps non-technical people understand that trade-off between speed and quality in business terms and how we need to square it up. So I asked a few colleagues in technical and delivery roles how they deal with it. So they said, tech debt is an issue type in JIRA. Anyone can raise it at stand-up. There's space in the team's capacity to do things outside the roadmap. And we have a separate backlog for, for tech debt. Then look at it in the prioritization of the overall workload. I also learned that tech debt is created as part of a software development process called Test Driven Development, or TDD, which is all about building software requirements into test cases before software gets developed and repeatedly testing the software against all of those test cases. But they said TDD isn't about testing, it's about design. It gives you the courage to write shit code, excuse me, because you will refactor it later. It's the opposite of measure twice, cut once. So it got me thinking, is test-driven development to tech debt what hypothesis-driven design is to UX debt? Um, so yeah, UX debt is a thing. Or so says um, service de designer Hira Javed. Uh, and also Nielsen Norman Group, who wrote a really useful article about it, which I'll share with, with these slides. Um, Hira says, when product decisions compromise the user experience, the result is UX debt. But sometimes we can't avoid this compromise. So can we use it to our advantage? Can we create UX debt and content debt and manage it in the same way as developers use technical debt? So remember the Confluence content record? We highlight candidates um, for content debt in yellow. So I know it's not very visible, um, but again, it works for the time being. It's a form of debt in itself, I guess. Um, so in this case, page path and titles that aren't consistent with the H1 heading and, um, and document for the reason for this further down the page and also in a separate content debt ledger. And then we create a new ticket in the backlog. We've got a design debt component that we created. It's like a custom component that we created in JIRA. So we can track and prioritize design or UX debt tickets as a team in the same way as we do tech debt. So this has had a decent impact on the design workflow. How many of you have been accused of being blockers because you wanted to get a piece of content absolutely right for your users? Well, um, I was, but um, occasionally still no longer. Managing UX debt lets us make prudent design decisions that allow us to learn faster and yield quick results, knowing that we will fix the deeper problems later when we know more. It's, in blocked the it's unblocked the design bottleneck and improved velocity on the team. Delivery managers and product managers are happy. Content design is an enabler, not a blocker all the time. And it's made the problems we're dealing with in content design more visible and tangible. We're using a shared language with delivery and tech to fix them. But it's not a panacea. It's a Faustian bargain that gives you quick wins as long as decisions to create debt are prudent and paid off quickly. Which brings us to the third problem. And for me, this is the biggest one, uh, not doing sufficient user research. As we discussed earlier, coronavirus has severely inhibited our ability to do user research, not necessarily on all teams at DWP, but certainly the ones I've worked on. We've just not been able to talk to users test with them and get the teams along to observe and learn what we need to learn in order to build services um, in the right way. It means we've got a lot of tickets on the board that are blocked and we can't get designs into development because we've not done enough research and testing to validate them. So 
what about using debt in a positive way again, um, but also being wary of it? This time, research debt. Can we create proto personas based on assumptions and about our users and use research debt to our advantage? So what is a proto persona? It's a prototype persona that's based on assumptions, things that we know from other services and, and pockets of desk research. Um, here's an example of a, of a proto persona. I don't expect you to read any of this. The text's um, far too small and probably not really allowed to show it too widely anyway, but I'll just let you know what it is and what we're doing with it. Um, so it's a representation of a user who's mid twenties, lives with a partner and is pregnant, um, has a, a progressive and chronic health condition and say works as a support assistant at a primary school. So that's kind of like a general um, pen picture, um, top left. In the top right hand quadrant, it's behavioral demographics and claim characteristics. So we went through the service and effectively retrofitted all the different reasons, um, all the different ways a user might answer um, the questions in the service in order to build a skeleton prototype persona um, about a person. I mean, obviously this isn't the right way of doing things. Um, and from that, we kind of, and from some of the research that we've done and what we already know about users and from the thousands of pieces of feedback we've had through the, the website feedback form um, and through desk research and things that we know from other services, we've been able to extrapolate a bunch of pain points and user needs that are still all very much assumptive that we're able to document. And then in the bottom right hand quadrant, potential solutions um, in the service things that meet those pain points and needs and things that don't necessarily. So rather than treating this as, a, as an artifact, as many personas are, we've kind of treated it as the basis for running scenarios. So when we're going through the service, we'll test it kind of as Mia. Um, does this meet Mia's mental model? Um, are there questions that she cannot answer? Um, where does she get stuck? And although this is not ideal, it's been better than nothing. Um, what we'll do with this then is if we um, deploy any feature, build any features on the back of this, this um, prototype persona testing that we've done, um, we'll then create some research debt and know that when we do get a user researcher on board on the service, they'll be able to go out and test these assumptions and either validate the work that we've done or go back out and iterate it. So the impact, not sure yet, we've only just started it in the last few weeks, but it has started to remove blockers on tickets. Um, we've been able to start iterating the service in response to user feedback, rather than leaving a piece of work in de development hell on the backlog because we've not been able to do any user research to validate it. We've been able to create some research to move it forward um, and iterate. So I think that's us. Has anyone got any questions? Really? There's one, there's one in the chat there, Dan. Uh, with the debt model, how do you convince stakeholders that you need to spend their valuable time, effort, et cetera, to rebuild something that's already live and performing? That's a very, very good question. Um, I guess if it's performing, is it relative? You know, so we try and get as much um, data as we can on how that a feature or that piece of content is performing, um, whether that's quantitative or qualitative. So we've got anal Google Analytics built into the uh, into the service. So at a fairly quant level, we can see how people are, are dealing with it at scale. But um, but then we're doing more qualitative research, or hopefully we will be when we get user researcher on board um, with specific groups to see um, if we're following that utilitarian approach as we have been doing, you know. Um, designing services for the highest volumes of users, then we're not dealing for the edge cases. Um, we're not able to um, 
meet that government design principle of this is for everyone. And when we go into a service standard assessment, this is going to be something that GDS pulls us up on. So, so really, it's, it's a difficult argument not to make for stakeholders because um, the accountability process is so solid and rigorous that it needs to meet user needs in order to move forward through the project life cycle. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying as well, you know, sometimes you don't spend time on it. You know, if it's there in the backlog, it's recorded and it's measured, you know, but I'll link you back to my secret shame page. You know, it, it has to be based on evidence and prioritised alongside anything else. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Vicky. She says, uh, the confidence documenting you showed is great, but sometimes that people... Uh, might wrongly think isn't agile, but okay, but it's something that people might wrongly think isn't agile. Did you have much putback, pushback when doing it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, the so in the agile manifesto it says um, you know always choose working software over comprehensive documentation something like that and, and really that's the worst thing that ever happened to, to agile teams um because i'm not really sure where it's coming from but when you've got um teams that are fairly high turnover like we have in civil service and um you've got projects that are passed from team to team at different phases it means that there's no continuity of knowledge corporate memory just doesn't work and people are going back through and going back over the same problems and it's not really a good use of people's time or taxpayers' money. So why aren't we documenting? Why is documentation not agile? Um, if we can build it into the process, it means that we're more agile. You know, we're able to um, have a working corporate memory of what we know and be able to iterate and build on that as teams turn over, as we hand over to new teams, maintaining the integrity of that knowledge base is, is crucial for a successful um, service, I guess. Don't know if anybody disagrees. That's my take on it. Okay, I've got a couple more questions just come through. So Kieran asks, how busy were you after the launch of your respective services, fixing and tweaking them? Were there more things to fix compared to services you've launched where you've had more time to build them? I think the short answer is we'll let you know when we're done fixing and tweaking them. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yes, we've been very busy. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there. I think there's a lot more compared to sort of services we've launched in a more controlled way. Um, but, you know, if the team's managed well, well, manages itself well, um, then what you end up with really is a, a healthy backlog. You know, there's a lot of issues in there. There's a lot of stuff that we know could be better. Um, and and we're, we're measuring, we're researching and testing all the time. Um, yeah, and we'll keep going. So I think uh, to compare, yes, quite a lot more, but uh, but now we're out of the, the immediate panic. Um, just a healthy backlog, so it's good. Dan, have you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just kind of what Pete said, really. Um, I think teams can see the service standard as kind of like the thing that we're aiming for, when really the service standard is there to provide a benchmark for um, good quality services that meet user needs. Um, so I think sometimes teams see the service standard, you know, it's kind of like, see like a, you know, what's the minimum we can do to meet the service standard in the assessment, um, rather than seeing it as, um, how can we make this service um, a good service for users so that of course it'll meet the service standard i'm not sure if that answers the question actually uh sort of yeah sort of. <laughs> let's go to another question from natasha uh which i think is more for pete and um, she says when iterating based on user feedback do you need more than one piece of feedback about an issue to make a change for example if only one person says they don't understand qualifying young person would that prompt you to make a change Yes, one single person. I'll be straight on that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, essentially, it's the uh, it, it's probably the same for both benefits that we've talked about. You know, they're, they're sort of means tested or contributions based. So some things that people answer 
have a material impact on the amount of help they will get. Um, so it, th there's a lot of things that you throw into the mix of prioritization. You know, if it was just one person uh, said they didn't quite like it, you know, it wouldn't rise to the top of the backlog. But uh, but if someone pointed out that has affected the amount of pension credit I get, um, that would be a bigger concern for us, you know, because uh, obviously we don't want to wait till problems manifest themselves. If we can spot them early on from one piece of feedback, um, that'll bump it up the priority list, yeah. Yeah, so it's about the impact of it as much as the, the quantity of things. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Kieran asks another question. He says, uh, do you see this model of launching services quickly persisting even in post-COVID times? We ordinarily spend months and months developing of services. Can we move to a quicker launch model, launch and then iterate quickly? Oh, good question. Mm, it is. I mean, I hope not. You know, I think particularly the uh, sort of the alpha phase and the discovery phase, uh, you know, it, it is a big thing to help you decide that you're doing the right thing. You know, if you come out of a discovery and decide the right thing to do is not to build anything at all, uh, that's a perfectly valid outcome. You know, if you miss those things out uh, and start from the fact of, yes, we want to build a digital service and put it online, um, I hope that won't become the default starting place. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. You know, I hope um, I hope not either. I think, you know, what this last year has been is just like a big exercise in creating all kinds of technical debt, research, design and service debt in general. You know, what, what it means is that if, we, if we're not able to get things right as early as possible, we create a whole load of failure demands on elsewhere, uh, on the department and across government and across public life, really impact on um, charities and third party organizations that support our benefit claimants at DWP because it's so hard to deal with navigate the complexity of the benefit landscape yeah. and so in order to get like real value um, for money and to meet user needs we really need to spend time understanding the problems that we're working with and spend more time on discovery and um, because discovery enables delivery too much focus on delivery um, puts itself at risk. Yeah, I think there's a there's a public sector thing as well. You know, we're there to help people. Um, if it's a private company doing things and, and they use Agile as a software development model, you know, move fast, break things, try something. Maybe I didn't make as much profit that quarter. Fine, I'll try something else. But, you know, if we work in that way, like I say, these things have a material impact on people's lives. You know, so if we're moving fast and breaking stuff, you know, we end up in the Daily Mail with, with poverty on our hands. I've got a hundred percent agree from Jane on the chat. With everything, thanks, Jane. Uh, yeah, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially, on the, especially on the, uh, the on Jane's crit article. Definitely, which is, yeah. Which, which is excellent. Which there is a link to in the chat as well, which is good. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, Jane. Yeah. Uh, has anyone got any other questions? Mm. Give people a couple of minutes just in case they've been mulling something over. Um, I suppose one question for me, of a very uh, general question, would be: if you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Hmm, that's a tricky question. On account of the fact that I didn't feel we were given much choice in the matter, <laughs> yeah, you know, we we moved as quickly as we could, and we we solved the problem that was in front of us. Um, you know, from my point of view on pension credit, we were lucky that we already had a roadmap and it just meant moving things that we'd already intended to do around. Um, but if I was starting to design a service from scratch, um, you know, I would possibly insist on at least a mini discovery, you know, a, a few days or a week to make sure we were solving the right problem in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'd have liked to um, got better at facilitation and um, running workshops. I spent a lot of time over the last year in meetings that have not really gone anywhere um, with circular dis cyclical discussions and not a lot of progress. If we could just implement some good workshop techniques in those, in those meetings to get to the point quicker, get value quicker, it could have saved quite a lot of pain and, and maybe... Um, so, I, so I'm trying to look into that at the moment, if anyone's got any tips on 
facilitation training, I will hoover, hoover them, up, them up. I've actually just written that down because I think that would be a really great topic, um, something around how to run a really good workshop, especially remote working, since that's something we're going to be doing for a while. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Top tip. Can I, can I recommend Lisa McClure? <laughs> yes, you can. Well done, Lisa. You've been nominated. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, we've got uh, five minutes left, which is a perfect timing. Thank you very much. Um, so before we go, I just want to, um, yes, thank you very much to Pete and Dan for an amazing talk. Um, personally, I thought it was incredible. And I love the combination of looking at the kind of front end, as it were. So, you know, like the, the, the secret shame concept, I just love that. And then the sort of of sort of peek behind the curtain of how things are running and some of the systems and processes you put in place, I think are really valuable as well. So, yeah, thank you. Really good. Um, and it's Excellent. just time um, to give a, a quick plug of what the next talk will be on. So this is in a month's time. Um, and it is going to be on how to have a good day at work. So this is uh, Emma. Let me just find her title. Emma Cragg. And she is a productivity and personal development coach. And she says... Where is it? Um, yes. So how to have a good day at work. Obviously, there's no one size fits all answer, um, but she'll be working to help us define what good means and what we can do to prepare for a good day or reset if things go off course. And um, so I think that's really helpful, particularly when we are working remotely, because I think when you're not in the same room as your colleagues, sometimes if you're having a not great day, um, it can be a bit harder to kind of pull yourself out of it. So, yes, yeah, so that should be good. And it's going to be dead practical and there's going to be some activities uh, for us to do as well. So do come along. Um, you can find out about it on the uh, Twitter for content folks, which is just uh, like content underscore folks. Um, and how have you found out about this one? Basically, it'll be the same methods. So <laughs> just keep an eye out for that. And um, just a quick point as well, if you uh, are not on the mailing list, get on it because um, in the interest of data privacy and everything, just because you've got a ticket to this event doesn't mean you'll be on the mailing list for future events. So you need to sort of actually opt in and then you just get an email once a month about what's coming up. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's it. So thank you very much to Pete and Dan and um, to everyone who attended and who asked questions and who participated in the chat. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Everyone can, well, everyone's telling you down that you should go and have a beer, so you should do that now. I think I might join you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, thanks very much, everyone, and see you next month. Cool. Thank thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks, Molly. Thanks for having us. <laughs>